Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about ecosystems. So this is probably going to be a pretty long video. Uh, so just bear with me. Here we have a picture of a bunch of different ecosystems that exist all over the world. So uh, first thing first, we, we have we're going to have a lot of vocabulary uh, with ecosystems. And the first words that I want to talk about are biotic and abiotic. Abiotic things are things that are non-living, not alive, never were alive, like weather, air, water, rock, soil, and the sun. Then biotic things are things that are living. Uh, so you see some examples here. Uh, it's kind of like sexual and asexual reproduction. When we put the A in front of something, it means the opposite. So biotic, bio means life, and then abiotic means not living. So let's open up your notes and start at the bottom. The cell is the basic unit of life. This is just a little bit of, re of a review. I have a eukaryotic cell here on the left for you and a prokaryotic cell on the right for you. Remember that the difference is the eukaryotic does have a nucleus and the prokaryotic does not. And then if I go a step further than that, we talked about how cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make organ systems, and then organ systems make an organism. An organism is a single living thing, one individual. And then a population is going to be a group of the same kind of organism. And they have to be living in the same area in order to be considered a population. In other words, they have to be able to interact with each other. They're either going to be competing with each other or they could be living in a cooperative group together like a school of fish or they will mate with each other. That's a population. So if they live in separate areas, it's not considered a population. Okay? It has to be the same kind of organism living close together. And then a community is when I have different kinds of organisms living together. So they're still living near each other, but now they're going to have, um, basically they could have predator prey relationships or your competitive relationships with each other. But instead of being the same organism, like in a population, I have different organisms, which make a community. And then if I add in the abiotic stuff, the non-living things, that makes an ecosystem. So it's all the living things plus, like in this case, the sand and the water and the sun and the air is going to be an ecosystem. And if I put all of the ecosystems together, that makes the biosphere or Earth. And then during the fourth nine weeks, we'll talk about planets and the solar system and the galaxy and the universe. So here we are in order. An organism is one individual. Organisms make a population. Several populations make a community. A uh, community plus the abiotic makes an ecosystem and then all the ecosystems make the biosphere, which a bunch of planets make the solar system. So here we have some examples of living things with non-living things. Even though it's an abiotic component, it still is important. And here are some examples of some living things with living things and how they depend on each other. The, this is a little bit of a review. You've been talking about habitats for a long time, right? That's just where an organism lives. We talked about niche when we did natural selection. It's just the role that an organism plays in an ecosystem. On to our next section of notes. A producer is also known as an autotroph. An autotroph is something that automatically gets energy. That's how I kind of remember it. it. It looks like it's automatically getting energy from the sun, uh, which is, a, in this case, we're talking about plants. Some autotrophs live at the bottom of the ocean where there obviously is no sun and they're getting energy uh, from hydrothermal vents and things like that. But um, in this case, we're talking about producers. We're talking about plants obtaining energy from the sun through photosynthesis. Here is photosynthesis. Remember, we take carbon dioxide and water and energy from the sun to make glucose and oxygen. Consumers are heterotrophs. Heterotrophs have to eat other organisms. Uh, and here you have a picture of a lion eating a zebra. So anything that is a consumer is going to also be considered a heterotroph. So let's talk about the different types of consumers. A herbivore eats plants. A carnivore eats meat or other animals. An omnivore eats plants and animals. We are omnivores. A scavenger is going to not be a hunter, really. For most, In most cases, they're going to eat something that's already dead that they have found. And then decomposers uh, break down the remains of dead organisms. And these guys are kind of like our recyclers of the world. 
and then onto the next flap, a predator um, hunts and kills other animals for food. Um, now we're getting into relationships and a prey is going to be what is hunted or killed by the predator. And then a parasite host relationship, one is getting harmed while the other is benefiting. For example, fleas and ticks and lice are all parasites and the host is what they live on. Um, and so in this case, a dog, right, that has a tick on it, um, deer, humans, they can all have parasites on them or in them. Uh, two other relationships that uh, are important are mutualism when both of the organisms benefit. This is like those eels that clean the teeth of, of a shark. Uh, the eel's getting food and the shark is getting his teeth cleaned. Or there's commensalism where one benefits and the other organism, organism is not affected. For example, there's birds that hang around with cows. Um, and they wait for the cow to move around and all the bugs jump out of the cow's way and they go and they eat the bugs that are jumping around. So that's commensalism because it's good for the bird, he's getting food, but it does not affect the cow. Now food chains are really, really important. The important thing about food chains are the arrows. Uh, the arrows show the direction of energy flow. So in this case, the energy is going from the sun to the grass, to the snail, to the bird. That's really important uh, how you draw the arrows. I see people drawing the arrows backwards and that's wrong. It makes it look like the snail ate the bird and that's a really scary snail. Uh, so that's not happening here. Remember, it's going in the, the direction of the energy flow. Here are the notes that you're gonna have. So you're gonna cut out the little squares and glue them in. These are some of your options on how you can glue it in, but they're basically all gonna have the same labels. Here are your labels. You have the sun, which is abiotic, and then you've got your producer or your autotroph, which could be your grass or your tree. And then you've got your primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers, which are all heterotrophs. They're all consumers. Primary comes first, right, primero, and then secondary comes second, and tertiary is like the third one. You could also have quaternary, cuatro, after that if you wanted to have another organism eating the hawk. Um, so all the energy originates from the sun. Okay, the sun is the most important thing um, here. Uh, we've it asked us to name the producers and consumers, which you've already done. And then the last question, what would happen if all the producers died? Or the, in this case, the grass or the tree. Um, if one thing dies, right, then it's gonna affect everything that comes after it in the food chain. It's gonna kill those two. Those guys are not gonna survive. A food web is gonna be multiple food chains put together uh, and, and in order to have a healthy environment or a healthy ecosystem you want to have lots of organisms in your food chain uh, we've got one in the ocean here and then a forest food chain here or sorry food web um, that shows multiple food chains like the grass to the grasshopper to the robin to the owl or we could say the grass to the rabbit to the fox and so on uh, the, that's a bunch of food chains put together to make a food web so here are your notes, and these are the labels. Uh, we have our, the grass is our producer, uh, and then mm, organisms can be primary or secondary consumers, just depending on uh, how you look at it. But uh, we've got multiple food chains here, like the grass to the rabbit to the hawk. Um, that could be the secondary consumer because it ate the rabbit, or it could be the tertiary consumer if I say the grass to the mouse is the primary, the snake is the secondary, and the hawk is the tertiary. Um, but this is not a really healthy food web because I don't have very many organisms in it. And then an energy pyramid shows how much energy is moving up to the next level. And the way that they show this is how the pyramid gets smaller and smaller as you go up. Uh, so think about it this way, right? If you inherited a bunch of money or if you're working at a job and you're making all of this money, 100% uh, of that money is not going to go to your kids when you die because you spent some of that money, right? Well, the same thing happens with energy. Um, when the rabbit here in this case eats the grass it's and then it gets eaten by the snake, 100% of the energy that the rabbit got from the grass is not going to go to the snake because the rabbit spent some of that energy he was jumping around looking for more grass to eat or making a, a nest or whatever or um looking for a rabbity girlfriend uh, so he spent some of that energy before he got eaten by the snake and that's what a pyramid is trying to show you only 10 percent of the energy is going to go up to the next level
Here is another example in the ocean. We've got plankton at the bottom and then fish and penguins and, and an orca at the very top and less and less energy is available as you go up. Here are your notes and let's fill that out. This is what your filled out notes should look like. So on the very right hand side, we've got what are called kilocalories. And that's how we measure energy whenever we eat food. If you've ever looked at the back of a food label, you'll see that it has kilo, uh, calories, which are actually kilocalories. They just put calories there. Um, and we, if we start out with 10,000 kilocalories at the bottom, only 10% of that goes up, so that's 1,000. And then 10% of that goes up, so that's 100. 10% of that goes up, so it's 10. So every time I'm losing 90% um, of it, only 10% is going up. And what I can do is I can just move the decimal or I can take off a zero depending on what your number is. And so we have the producer at the bottom and then our primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers as we go up. Here's another example of a couple of um, food chains or, or they could also be pyramids. Uh, but again, uh, we've got our different kinds of consumers here and this one also goes all the way up to quaternary consumers, our, our fourth consumers. Biodiversity is really, really important. And what biodiversity means is bio means life and diverse means different. In order for an ecosystem to be healthy, I want to have a lot of different types of organisms. I want to have lots of producers and lots of primary consumers and secondary consumers and so on. Uh, so the, it's the existence of many different types of plants and animals in an ecosystem. So there are two types of biodiversity. The first one is genetic biodiversity, which means I want to have individuals in a population to not be related to each other. Uh, so remember, a population is when I have different, when I, sorry, when I have the same type of organism. Like here, we, we can talk about a population of cheetahs. Uh, we want the population of cheetahs to not be related to each other, right? We don't want them to be cousins or brothers and sisters mating with each other because that would not be healthy for the offspring. Uh, and that's a problem that we're having with cheetahs because the population has gone so low because of hunting. Um, that can cause a problem in the next generation of cheetahs. Uh, so we want genetic biodiversity. We, what, what wildlife officials are doing now is they're taking and capturing cheetahs from one area and moving them to a different area and releasing them so that they know if they breed with each other there, they're going to be breeding with, with cheetahs they're not related to because they're from different populations. Uh, so that's genetic biodiversity. And then ecological biodiversity is when I have lots of different primary consumers and secondary consumers and so on. And so if something does happen to the population, like something kills off one of the producers, there's still other producers out there that the organisms can eat. Or if something kills off one of the primary consumers, there's still other prey that the, the predators can eat. Why is it important? Biodiversity helps to maintain the sustainability of an ecosystem. To, what the word sustain means to keep going. And we want ecosystems to be sustainable. If something happens, like a population dies out or something goes wrong, we want the ecosystem to be able to recover and kind of fix itself and continue on. We don't want it to totally disappear. And if it, is, if it has a large biodiversity, then the chances are that that ecosystem will sustain itself, will continue on, is greater because you've got lots of different organisms in there. Three threats to biodiversity within an ecosystem. I actually have four here. So one is habitat loss. An example is uh, the orangutan, our orangutans are losing their habitat because of palm oil plantations that are being built in the rainforest. So there's a lot of deforestation happening to, to uh, make that into farmland to grow palm trees for palm oil. Uh, pollution is also killing a lot of animals. Overfishing means that we're fishing too much and we're not leaving enough of the population out there to reproduce and create the next generation of fish. And then invasive species is when we have a species that comes in that doesn't belong there. It's invaded. Uh, and so it takes away resources from the species that do belong there. So it's a new competitor for them. Uh, it also um, can you know, it, it can kill other organisms that it's not supposed to be killing because it's not supposed to be there. So that's an invasive species. And all of these things are destroying ecosystems and are destroying the biodiversity in ecosystems. Here is an example of what you might see on a test. 
uh, in terms of biodiversity. On the left, we don't have very many organisms, so we've got low biodiversity here, which means low sustainability. If something happens, it might not be able to recover. On the right, we have high biodiversity, which means we have a lot of different organisms, lots of different producers and primary consumers and secondary consumers and so on. So that means high sustainability. Here are two more examples. So which one has a higher biodiversity? It's going to be the one on the right hand side because we have more organisms. We have a bigger, a big predator that's at the top. And so there's going to be a better chance of that um, ecosystem being able to sustain itself. Okay, thanks for watching and I will see you guys in class.